Hello everyone, and welcome to the video summaries for the book From Social Science to Data Science by me, Bernie Hogan, and published by Sage. This is the prologue, or chapter zero. Um, the prologue is a bit of an introduction to the book and some of the reasons why we might want to use the book or how to use the book. Uh, in this video lecture, I'm also going to go through things like how to get Jupyter set up on your computer. If you happen to have Jupyter already set up on your computer, uh, and really just want to dive into a discussion of what's data science about, what's social data science about, and uh, some ideas on programming, then head on over to chapter one. On the other hand, if you're curious about the following topics here, then stick on around for the prologue. First thing we're going to discuss is, you know, who is this book for? You might have questions about how much Python we're going to uh, need in order to start this book, um, as well as how much math and statistics are you going to see in this book? Uh, finally, um, I'm going to go through uh, section summaries uh, and then a little, little tiny brisk summary of all the chapters of the book here, and then some final writing and code considerations. Along the way, I'm also going to show how to use JupyterLab and uh, Jupyter Notebooks and how to install that on your own computer. So who's this book for? Well, we might say um, primarily this is a book that's written for students with an interest in computational social science and the questions within the social sciences where, uh, where data can be compiled and uh, you can create a distribution of something. For the most part, I'm really going to be focusing on how do we get a distribution? What does it mean? How do we filter it down? Or how do we connect that distribution to other distributions? That tends to be how we... Uh, make the best use of computers, and how we make the best use of sort of data science techniques. So let's say um, you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily a student, um, but maybe you're someone who wants to skill up from a historically popular language like Stata or SPSS, and you've heard about Python or R, and you want to transition over. You might be someone indeed who knows R, but want to explore data access and management in Python, R and Python being two of the more popular languages for data science and machine learning, but this is not necessarily a book about machine learning, uh, even if it is a book about data science. You know, this might be for anyone who's taken an introduction to Python course, and you know a little bit of Python, and you want to know where to go next in a data science way, rather than maybe in a computer science way, or maybe setting up a Raspberry Pi or something. Uh, this would be for how you, you know, get distributions, make claims on them, and, and so forth. And finally, it might be uh, useful for you if you have an interest in social media analytics or just a, a general understanding of social media and other mediated communication practices, and you want to see how you can apply data to them. So why in Python? Uh, well, Python's a very popular computer language. Um, it writes somewhat like English, and, uh, but the spaces and the capitalization matters. Uh, it's presently the de facto language of machine learning, uh, even if it's boosted by specialist languages like Julia and Java, depending on the context. So Python's about 30 years old, and there's new versions, uh, but those new versions change very little, and certainly very little um, for this book. Although it is worth noting that uh, I had to make some changes as it does evolve over time, but this should be pretty much what we'd expect for, uh, for a book that was written in the middle of 2022. So Python's freely available on all major operating systems, whether it's a Linux, Mac, or a Windows. It can be run from a command line, uh, from a script. You can write your own little script as a Python file and run that. Or you can run it from the browser, which is what we'll be doing via JupyterLab. The book starts with the notion that you can understand the basics of Python, so we're going to want to assume that. These are available through a variety of online intro courses, such as my own free uh, Introducing Python on GitHub. Now you'll notice over here on the left-hand side, we've got this globe with a click there. When, whenever we see that, um, it's likely that I'm going to go over to the browser and have a look at something there. So let's do that right now. Okay, so I'm going to go to Firefox as my browser, and then we'll see here, this is uh, my, um, my GitHub page, and from there we can see Introducing Python. Uh, introducing Python, and here's what we kind of would assume that you'd know before uh, before going on to this book. Uh, this book right here is free. Uh, you can either check out the PDF, which uh, is in there, and I've clicked on. So you can see kind of the tables of contents there. Or you can go into the chapters, and uh, for each one of these chapters, you can either view them online, if you just want to look at the text. You can run them on your own computer, or you can run them in, um, in Google Collab or Binder. 
Now, we'll see that again when we look at uh, uh, this book from Social Science to Data Science. But this is just one example of several resources that you could use, or actually many resources that you could use, to learn Python. Uh, another one might be Jake Vanderplas's Whirlwind Tour of Python, which is pretty similar to this, but a couple years older. Um, and uh, this just talks you through it. Now, in order to run it on your own computer, you'd need Jupyter. Uh, before we get there, though, just have a little sense of some of the things that we would want to do for, um, uh, for Python. Well, you'd already want to know what a variable type is, whether something is a string, an integer, a float, and two really important types, um, a list and a dictionary. A list is a type for uh, having items in sequence, and a dictionary is a type for key value pairs. So I might say apple, and then it might return uh, Granny Smith, or it might be turned red, but it's a, it's a key value mapping. So loops and conditionals you'll want to appreciate, and so those are things like an if-else statement. So how to construct a statement, so you say if something is happening, then you do this, and if something else is happening, well, do something else. Uh, you'll want to know about for loops, which is a really important basis for how we manage distributions. We don't always use for loops um, directly. Uh, sometimes we use other ways, but for loops are the kind of the first way that we think about things in a distribution because we do something for each element in a, in a collection. Uh, one of my favorite ways to use for loops is to use list comprehensions. It might be called uh, syntactic sugar or just a kind of a different way of coding than a standard for loop, but you'll see it um, you'll see it in use uh, a lot in my code and it's worth the uh, it's worth being familiar with that. You're going to want to know how to read, call and write a function. Uh, so a function is a statement where you define the name of a function, give it some things that you want to go into the function. Those would be um, parameters, and you can set parameters with uh, arguments. You can say it's make this thing true or false or send in a string or whatever. And you're going to want to know how to get stuff back out of a function. Now, when I say that, I mean it in a kind of a simple way. I don't mean in an overly involved way. Um, if you just have a kind of a sense of this from an introductory Python course, you should be all right. You should be all right for this book, because uh, we don't really do a lot of coding in this book, but we do need to use some coding, of course, uh, for these sorts of tools, and so you will see it uh, uh, pretty much everywhere. Okay, so now where to get Jupyter? Um, where to get what we need for this book? Well, the uh, the code for the book is available here at my uh, my website, but uh, uh, let's go first through uh, Jupyter Lab as a coding environment. So Jupyter can run multiple notebook files in a tabbed environment, kind of like a browser. So it's like a browser in a browser. Now uh, you can get Jupyter through a variety of ways, but I recommend the Anaconda Individual Edition here, uh, and that includes a uh, that includes Jupyter Lab and uh, useful packages like Pandas. Now you notice that pandas here is written in a slightly different font, as is these uh, extensions right here. When I use um, fonts like that, that means that we are using um, some sort of technical term or code. So pandas is a library in, in Python, and uh, we will actually be we'll be entering things into pandas, and it will you know look like code. So now uh, it's worth noting that Jupyter Lab does not stop when you shut down your browser. So if you run it in a browser and you close that browser window, you're not necessarily stopping um, JupyterLab. Now, you can also run the notebooks through uh, Google Collab and through Binder. So we can uh, demonstrate JupyterLab over here, and I'm going to first going to go over to the browser. And once again, you can see here, you can download it by clicking on the download link. It already knows that I'm on a Macintosh machine, so it's uh, suggesting it for Mac OS, but you can see those for, for Windows and Linux as well. And this is the um, this is the free individual edition, and it should have just about everything you need. It's pretty big, and it will take about 2 gigabytes once it's decompressed and installed, so make sure you have the space on your computer for it. When you do download and install it, then you can head on over to uh, the website for this book, From Social Science to Data Science. It's a bit sparse here now, but don't worry, it'll, uh, it'll be all clear and full, kind of like this one, maybe by the time uh, the book is out. So, hey, we, uh, we go over here and you can see the chapters and some of the data. Data we'll be using in different chapters, not a huge amount of data will be available. In fact, some of the biggest data we'll be looking at later on, um, we're going to download live from the web. The chapters themselves, if you click on any one of them in GitHub, you can actually see that summary. 
um, you can click here to perhaps even open it in Google Collab if you don't have Jupyter uh, downloaded and you don't have it running. However, uh, I do have it downloaded and running, and I do want to uh, I do want to show that. One of the things I wanted to point out is that there's uh, multiple ways to run Jupyter Lab, and a lot of students when they first start, they are going to run it using the Anaconda Navigator. So let's see, this is the Anaconda Navigator. You get this, and it's got some programs including R Studio and uh, some other things here. Spider is a development environment for Python. Um, but what we'll be looking at here is Jupyter Lab 3.32. You might have a slightly different number, and, and, and that's okay, but you probably won't have one that's, uh, that's behind this. So it should have all the features that we're expecting. Jupyter Notebook is for, no, for loading just a single Jupyter Notebook, and we're not going to be bothering with that. Now, normally you might think I'm going to click Launch here, but I'm not going to do that. I just wanted to show you this. Um, I think now that we've seen it, we can probably just close it. Uh, you can use this later on to update your files, but I would, uh, 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 you know, I wouldn't be worrying about that right now. So I'm going to go and quit this. So instead of running through uh, Anaconda Navigator, I actually recommend running Jupyter Lab through the terminal or the command prompt. If you're on Windows, you would search for this by uh, once you've downloaded Jupyter and everything, typing Anaconda prompt. Uh, into the uh, the search bar. Uh, you do get a command prompt by default for Windows, but it doesn't have everything uh, set up. Depending on the version of Windows, you might uh, type Anaconda PowerShell as well. Um, in either of these, what you're going to get is a is a window where you type in commands. Now, uh, on Windows, it will on PowerShell will be like this by default. It'll be blue with white. On Mac, by default, it it will probably be white with black text. So I've just changed it slightly on mine. We're not going to see too much in here. I know it's tiny, uh, but uh, you know we can zoom in. We're really only going to type one command in here, and that's Jupyter and lab. So we type that, and uh, it will run. Now you'll notice that it'll run from this particular uh, directory. Now what directory is this? On my computer, it's just work. That's the name of my it's my work computer. I called it work, and so it's that's going to be the root directory. Now depending on where you navigate in your uh, uh, in your computer, if you type Jupyter Lab from there, it'll start from there. Why is that important? Because you want to be able to navigate to your files, and if you start from a really deep directory, you might not actually be able to get back to the files you expect. So here we are. We're going to go Jupyter Lab from uh, just my root directory, the generic directory we get when I when I open a terminal. You'll see that it, what it's done is it's um, it's got a lot of um, uh, output right here. That's not necessarily going to be relevant for us. Sometimes you will, um, sometimes you'll see an issue where it might say um, that you need a password or something. Um, just checking out, uh, checking out the output from this can be very helpful, but normally it should just run a okay. One thing I want to point out up here is that uh, what we see here is it says up top localhost and then four eighths. That right there is a port and that localhost means your computer, so it's actually running a server on your computer. Um, now that it's running that server, um, you can then use this and interact with it in the browser. If you happen to see another number here, like 8889 or 8890, that means you probably have multiple versions of JupyterLab running at the same time, maybe because you ran one from Anaconda Navigator that you never shut down, and one from the terminal. So kind of be careful about that. You don't want your computer to uh, tie up too many resources just to uh, make use of this. Now we can see here I've got the chapters of the book and we just say book and chapters. Now these are not the um, uh, I actually wrote the book in uh, in this Jupyter Lab program and exported it but because of the nature of the book and publishing and other matters uh, that uh, what I have here is a version of the book where all of the um, all of the text of the book is available through the book. Uh, it's summarized in these PowerPoint slides that I'm giving, but all the code is still here. And so in the prologue, there's not really much code. In fact, we only have one right here. How much Python should I already know? In this particular case, we can see uh, we have a um, some code right here, and uh, we can see that it's got some, uh, some output. Can you make sense of this code? Could you have written it yourself? Well, one thing we want to do whenever I first start a Jupyter Lab 
uh, instance is uh, I want us to go and clear the output. Now you'll notice that I have the output in there. The reason that I have that in there is because I want you to be able to cross-check your own output with the output that I gave. If we're getting data live from the web, that output will almost certainly be different. But if we're working with stuff right here in the program, then, uh, then it should be exactly the same. Um, now in this case, I'm going to go up to tabs. There we go, see. Restart kernel and clear all outputs. I, I want to do that whenever we first start a uh, whenever we first start a, a Jupyter Lab notebook, so that we have a fresh canvas upon which to check out our programming. Now it's worth noting that I, I like to also have a, a spare copy of these around, so that uh, this is my working copy right here, and then that we have a, a different copy for um, uh, you know just in case any mishaps happen and we want to wonder what was the code supposed to look like when I first did it. So I'm going to do that. Restart, clear all outputs. It disappears. And that's pretty much it. There's nothing else going on here. So I'm going to run this, and we're going to want to get the output. In this case, this is a function. It checks the type of a value. Um, it returns these values right here by joining them. There's no for statements. There's no list comprehensions. You know, surely we could uh, include those. But I just want to, I want to make clear that if you can understand this, then you're pretty much at the uh, the place where we want to be. You could certainly practice a little more. But I don't want you to think that you need to constantly be practicing the basics. Because the thing is, once you um, have enough of the basics to get started, it's often useful to get your hands into, into real code and into data and use that as a way to motivate your practice of the, um, of the rest of the skills. OK, so there's not really much else there in the prologue, is there? Uh, so we're just going to go back uh, to PowerPoint. But bef oh, before I do, I want to show you how this is going to look for the rest of the video lectures. If we go up here, see this? This is just a Firefox ad, and it turns the current window into a pop-up. It's something that I use so that uh, now it's turned into a pop-up. Well, we can't see it. I'm going to bring it over here. And now that means the whole screen is taken up by JupyterLab. I don't have any browser tab windows or other things distracting me. I've just got the JupyterLab experience right there. So I'm going to go back to PowerPoint and see where we are. OK, so now that said, I did want to reinforce that uh, we do have a repository. You can click on there. And the repository also includes a, a mix of exercises that go with each chapter. Uh, these exercises are a mix of questions with fixed answers and some open ideas. Uh, a lot of them have been road tested in my courses at the University of Oxford uh, in the Oxford Internet Institute. So if we are looking at a book on data science, we might want to wonder how much math and statistics. A lot of people would be a bit hesitant if it's too math or stats heavy. Uh, indeed, some books, uh, such as um, uh, An Introduction to uh, Computational Social Science, can get very heavy with math very quickly. Um, this book is not that heavy with math or with stats, although we do teach uh, or explore a number of introductory math and stats concepts. Things like sets and set intersections are going to be really important for understanding how to merge data. Uh, similarly with statistics, the basics of a, of a correlation and a linear regression are going to be really useful for us understanding the relationship between two distributions. That being said, this is not a course in statistics and it's not a course in math. Uh, it's meant to get you uh, up and running in the, the Python that you might need in order to pursue that further. Certainly if you're going along to uh, machine learning, uh, you will definitely need much more math and stats. Uh, particularly linear algebra, in order to understand fully what sort of things are happening inside of a neural net or a transformer model. But even these days, there's a lot of work that happens where you can uh, download someone's uh, Jupyter Notebook file or run it in Google Collab and have a lot of those details behind you. The problem is, is that if you don't have the sort of data analysis skills um, that we've uh, shown here in this book, then you can do those off-the-shelf things, but it's hard to know where to go next. Uh, and so what we want to do here is really get a lot of those basics and basics of managing and wrangling and accessing data down so that when you do go on to more complicated work, you can, uh, you can do it with the stuff that you think is important, the data that you want to download or analyze, and not just the toy data sets that have been provided for you. So now by the end of the book, you should be able to think critically about how phenomena are encoded as data. We're not going to take data as a pre-given. Even if we download stuff as data, 
the way it was produced as data was through some sort of social process. So we're going to want to reconsider that and rather than just make assumptions about it. In fact, that reconsidering process can really help us generate some neat research questions uh, that we can use and apply to the data. We're going to want to be able to import and reshape data from a variety of sources. Uh, it used to be the case where if, say, in SPSS, you would expect to get a file in SPSS, or in Stata, you'd get a file in Stata format. But we don't really do that so much anymore. Normally, data is in a number of standard formats uh, that come down from the web in, in different ways depending on the context, but it might be a CSV, a JSON, or XML, but they tend to be standard. We should be able to access them from the web and from files, so we should be able to uh, learn how to get data down from the web. Now, I'm going to focus on Twitter and Reddit, which are pretty common sites for social media analysis, but we're not going to go deep into uh, the architecture of Twitter or of Reddit, but rather make use of them as ways to think about the general ways in which we access data from the web. Once we have that data, we're going to want to ask questions about it. And so around halfway through the book, we pivot towards uh, some stuff with uh, research questions. And so from there, we're going to want to ask about how do we ask questions inductively versus deductively versus abductively. We're going to want to clean existing data. So once we get the data down, we can't just start using it. We might have to reshape it, tell the program that it's in a different type, and so forth. And so we'll show how to do that. And then finally, um, we're going to be able to ask specialized descriptive questions about time or time series, um, about language use, about conversational relationships, um, the sort of things that we would do at networks, and, this, and, and geographic variations as well. So within this space, there are um, some key questions in social data science, uh, and these aren't necessarily topic specific. So one is, can we get the data that we want? Uh, can we, is that data accessible? Is it accessible in an ethical way? Is it only accessible by uh, people who work for a platform, but not those outside? What happens when we make an insight from that data and for whom? Is that insight for us? Is it for the people who are creating the data, the users of a social media platform, for example? Um, is it for someone who wants to govern that platform or find a new way to design things that might change people's behavior for maybe for the better or for safety or community? Um, will we be able to update our claims with new data? You know, If we have new data, either in a streaming form or maybe the uh, the same data, but uh, with an extra year collected, will we, will we have new claims? We might want to ask, can we encode data in a way that allows us to measure what we want to measure? We'll talk a lot about that in the next chapter, uh, because sometimes we might have an idea of a latent or abstract concept, and then we have ways to measure it with existing data, but they don't quite mesh. So we're going we're gonna to ponder that, um, and we want to consider that throughout the whole book. Um, we want to say, how can we display either statistical or quantitative claims? How, how can we do that effectively? Is it just output from the program, or should we put it in a nice table? If we put it in a graphic, what should the graphic or uh, the figure show? And then finally, what about those who are excluded? Um, is this by design? Is it that this is a membership-only space? Is it a place that is excluded because of language use? People don't use the right language? or as in the, the default or supported languages? Uh, does, it, uh, does it only work for certain parts of the world? Um, does focusing on some kinds of data, say maybe politics on Twitter, thus lead us to focus on research claims for those who are on Twitter, um, not the whole population that might vote on those political matters? So does this lead to social inequalities? Do we start, start focusing on what the... Uh, what might call the Twitterati want, and not what uh, people want more broadly. So now I want to give a brief uh, overview of the sections in the book and those chapters that uh, go through those questions, uh, and then we'll uh, you'll be able to see the rest of them in depth, of course, in subsequent videos. So the first part is we start with uh, thinking programmatically. What does it mean to think like a programmer, like an algorithm? It helps us structure our own code as well as understand how code as practice is imposed on the world. The fact that we have shifted from, uh, in the early days of the web, hodgepodge websites, geocities, and text to something very structured and coherent is not a coincidence. It involves how uh, we scale up our understanding of uh, social relationships and how to represent them. 
So we first start with an introduction, which is thinking about that. It's a bit theoretical and gets into some strategies for coding. In the second chapter, we look at the series, which is the distribution and a, or a way in which we can make use of any given distribution. So this might be a, a set of measurements about um, when you last tweeted. Uh, it might be a set of measurements about uh, how much sleep per night, which I think is the example in the book. Um, in chapter three, we look at the data frame, which is like multiple distributions in the same object. So it's like a table of data. We might have um, rows as cases, so person one, person two, person three, and then the columns will be measurements. You know, how much sleep did they get? How often do they tweet? Do they have a Facebook account? And so forth. And so when we have a distribution as a, or set of distributions as a data frame, then we can start doing some really fascinating work with it, comparing them, slicing them, reshaping them, whatever. Now, section two is about how we get data into that basic structure. Uh, and so data is all around us in the world. Uh, so first, we're going to want to introduce uh, different kinds of file types. In particular, the main issue is between those that look like a table, so they have rows and columns, and those that don't. They're often in a nested or hierarchical structure, which we'll show, explore, and parse. In the next chapter, Emerging and Grouping Data, we think about two tables and how do we combine them. Or how do we take one table and make some aggregates about it? So we might want to take a table and look at, uh, if we have a number of people in different countries, we might want an average per country. Um, or if we have uh, data about a country, and then we have people from that country, we might want to take the data from that country and bring it in with the people um, in that country. So we might have unemployment figures for a particular country or GDP figures for a country and uh, it's really useful to have that combined with the cases where there might be many cases for any given country. Once we get that, then we'll let's think about getting the data from the web. So first we're going to get data from the open web. Uh, and on the open web, it's just, you know, you just point your browser at something and down comes the data. Uh, and uh, we're also going to want to discuss in there some of the ethical issues with that. How do we do this? Uh, patiently? How do we do this in terms of ways that minimize data collection so that we don't have more data than is, uh, than is necessary for the task at hand? In Chapter 7, we're going to look at APIs. Uh, APIs, or application programming interfaces, are ways in which we can get selective bits of data from the web, often by calling a particular URL or address and the data will come down. It often comes down in one of the file types that we discussed in Chapter 4. In order to do that, however, we often need some way to authenticate ourselves so that the data controller, such as the server behind Twitter or Facebook or whatever, so that it knows who we are and why we should be allowed to have that data and not other data. So in the third section, it's a two chapters right there, where we start thinking about research questions. What do we do with this data? Uh, so this will be more general, and the first one is on Things about like um, prior expectations versus expected distributions, how to think about things inductively, which would be like maybe from the data, or deductively, as in from a theory about the data, or abductively, maybe about your intuition. So we'll explore those as a series of topics first, and then we'll look at how to represent them and how to represent expectations. Because we, we normally have expectations going into any data analysis task, but then we observe data, and we got to ask, well, does the data meet our expectations? Is there a trend that goes in one way or another? Are there outliers in the data? If we split the data into smaller groups, will one group be related to something, and will another group not be related to something? These are all ways in which we take our expectations, and then we, we update them based on what we, what we observe. Um, so we're going to look at that uh, visually, how to say, observe things and patterns maybe from figures or visualizations and we're also going to look at some of that statistically where statistics there are statistical routines that can tell us whether uh, what we see we might even observe by chance even if there's a pattern or statistically we would say it's very unlikely that we would observe that by chance you there's probably some sort of relationship worth pursuing in there Sometimes we can only do that with stats. Sometimes we can do that with visualizations. And sometimes the two don't, don't mesh. So that's why in this chapter, um, I put the two of them together. We're going to learn how to annotate data and, uh, and explore it. The last section of the book is the longest section of the book. 
Um, it's first a chapter where we take um, a Stack Overflow, uh, or sorry, a Stack Exchange export. Now, Stack Overflow is a, a really useful site for programming and programmers. It's often a place where I turn to first for simple questions and uh, nice clear answers from them. But it's it's really big. It's it's um, the export of it is uh, maybe 15, 16 gigabytes, and that's can be really hard for someone to use on their computer. Fortunately, there are smaller stack exchanges on a variety of topics. In this book, I've selected the movie stack exchange. And so we can download that movie stack exchange and then and then load it into the program. We can clean the data. Um, we can give it, uh, take out the HTML from the comments or take uh, numbers and make them numeric so that the computer can calculate averages with them. And once we do that, once we do all that sort of cleaning work, uh, then we can do further, more specialized work on different kinds of social information, in particular information about language, about time, about space, and about relationships. So the specific ways in which uh, we can explore those four topics um, are, through these, uh, are through these analytical lenses. Uh, NLP is an increasingly popular one for understanding text and how to use text in an automated way. Uh, some of it is word counting and some of it is more specific than that or more careful than that. Time series analysis uh, require us to structure our data according to time or temporal patterns. So we might have observations that come in all through the day and what we really want to know is how many per hour or whether there was a trend uh, from one day to the next day. So we'll show how to structure the data that way and answer some simple descriptive questions that uh, we can use time plots for. <laughs> Chapter 13 is about relationships between individuals, cases, or people. We normally talk about that through network analysis. Um, in the social sciences, we would be familiar mainly with social network analysis. And then in the natural sciences, people often talk about network science. Uh, in this chapter, it kind of blends a little bit of the two, but focuses on the Python package Network X, and how we can clean some of this data in a way that puts it in a social network. We might ask, if there's someone asking a question, who was the person that answered? And then if we stitch all of those relationships of who asks the questions and who answers them together, well, that's a social network. So what are we going to learn? Do we learn that one person answers everyone's question, or that a core set of people answer most people's questions, or that different people answer different questions. That can make a difference to the health of a community or the way in which it's governed. So understanding not just what people talk about, but who talks to whom can be really useful. Finally, we'll look at geographic information systems. It's often common to want to have a map to represent data. Um, we won't be going too far into this. We'll basically look at how to create a map um, and then color code that map using what's called a choropleth. We'll look at different ways to set the choropleth that might make things more or less useful. Finally, I'll be using some data about COVID. And the reason why COVID data is because uh, we can use a repository where that data is uh, freely accessible and highly granular, not just at the country level, but at the sub-country or sub-national level. Um, it won't be from the Stack Exchange, but we will have that data available, and it is on the GitHub for the page or for the book. Now, finally, before we go, just some writing and code considerations about this particular book. First, be patient, as Python, like any computer language, is very fussy. You know, it cares about case sensitivity, so a capital letter A is not the same as a lowercase a, usually. It cares whether there's spaces in the program. And at the beginning of each line, using spaces says this is inside something, maybe inside a loop or um, inside a dictionary, inside a function. Uh, it cares about open and close parentheses and will not work if they're not balanced. So every time you open a parenthesis, you should close it and things like this. You know, If you try to reference a variable before it creates it, it might get confused. So generally speaking, we'd say Python does not like ambiguity. Now, that being said, um, sometimes the things we want to do are a bit ambiguous, so you might not be sure the right Python uh, that you need to use. So in that case, be sure to tinker. Um, if you can ask a question, well, can I get the type of this type of variable? Just write type and then put that variable in, in Jupyter. Try it for yourself. Uh, you know, have a safe copy of these notebooks so that you can feel comfortable tinkering with a newer copy 
But indeed, go and explore this stuff. Don't just run the code as I've written it. Make it your own. So you can try to alter the code. You can ask for new variables. You can get creative. Uh, all the code for this book is released under the MIT license. So that does mean we accept no liability. But on the other hand, uh, you are pretty much free to do with it whatever you like. Now you can try uh, the extensions and reflections at the end of each chapter. In those extensions, I often give a more general uh, kind of task or idea in, that we can use in order to put a lot of those I, uh, ideas mentioned in the, in the chapter together as a project. Um, on the GitHub page, uh, there might be some more rote exercises per chapter, as well as some of these sort of challenges that might help you think, oh, if I can put that together, I could say something really neat. Now remember, coding is a practice. And it's an and practice, not an or practice. We might want to think about Python and R or and Stata or and LaTeX. Um, this is not a place where we're going to promote Python as the be all and end all language or try to compete with R. In fact, there's lots of places in this book where we mention some texts in R because that's where that's where things are written that are more useful. And perhaps some people might do the same thing in that book where they admit Python is more useful for maybe projects like PyTorch, which are really useful for ML. I mean, ultimately, for me, I think that we should uh, build on this knowledge and really appreciate where some of the differences come from between different languages and not kind of just lobby for, for one or the other. Uh, and most importantly, have fun with it. You know, have fun. Try to find some joy in this. Discover something that you might think you could know, but couldn't do so before learning the skills in this book. And then when you can do that, gosh, I hope that can be really satisfying for you and as satisfying for you as it's been for me to, to write this, to put it together, and to try to see it, uh, see it out in the world and maybe help you uh, with your own academic work. So that's it. Thank you for uh, checking out this particular video lecture. Uh, the next one up is chapter one, which is the introduction to the book.